This is the story of a man and a woman who lived in a beautiful garden. It's a story of a snake who tricked mankind for thousands of years. It's a story of God and his promises. It's the story of one who's coming back to crush the head of the snake. And to give us that home we once had, we might have forgotten. Have you ever not known what to do with your hands? That sounds like a silly question. Have you ever known not what to do with, or, or what to do with your, your feet? Um, or your, and, and here's where I'm heading with this. See, see, we really don't know what to do at times. I've seen some of you. I mean, you're, you know, when you take a picture, I mean, ladies, come on. Um, I, think, I think this will make me look, I don't know, better. Maybe I'm thinner. If I look, if I do this, maybe I could hide behind people and uh, that would be good. I could be in the picture here. And then if you're like me, you're always, nobody wants to be the, um, when you're doing a group selfie, like a big giant head, I'm the closest one. You look giant, you know. I, that's usually me, I'm that guy. But um, I, I, I'm going to contend today that we really don't know what to do with our bodies. In fact, this topic here today, we've said that we're talking about relationships. And as we've been forming and shaping this message around a text that we chose some months ago, what I've come to realize is this message is not really, it is about relationships. It's clearly about relationships. Um, we've told our, our, our kids, you know, it might be a good day to be out of the room. Now, some of us, you know, there's fuzzy edges on that. Some parents are a bit more progressive in the way they want to, uh, you know, present truth to their children early on. Um, I, Stacy and I tended to, to do that early on and then, and then talk to them ourselves in our home about questions they would have. But there's always those who have different opinions. So we wanted to offer that opportunity for you today. I don't know that I'm going to say anything that's going to be off the, 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 the grid or something, or, but I hope I embarrass some of y'all. That would probably be really good. But it's not really about, um, it, it is about sex, okay? Now we're going to talk about sex, but in the traditional, okay, uh, way that we used to talk about sex. Only recently, when you look at the etymology of the word or the use of the word, you know, you can do that now, you see this, this catapulting of the word sex in our culture today because now we talk about sex not as a designation of male or female. That's what it means. Now we talk about it as an act. And we're always talking about sex. We got to, everybody's talking about sex. Now, today I'm going to talk about all these things, but where this has landed kind of surprised me along the way. This is actually a sermon on the body. Um, it's really a theology of the body. And I don't know if you've ever heard a talk or a sermon, a teaching on a theology of the body. I, I can't remember that I have. I don't think I've ever really preached this before. And as a result, I think we don't know what to do with our bodies because we've not been given clear instruction, biblical instruction, from God's word. So we're going to talk about how do we, what do I do with my, with my hands? What do I do with, with, with my feet? What do I do with my body? And yes, how has God created us male and female? And how does our body, your body, my body, tell a better story? There's purpose and meaning behind it all. So I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, verse 12 through, 12 through 20 is going to be the text here. So turn there. And um, if you don't have your Bible, um, bring your Bible to, to church every week. Of course, this is our central text. Or, or yeah, for the course. And always. But I'll put the, the verses on the screen. Um, you know, some of you now, I, I'm, I'm going to just go ahead and say it. The, the, the talk about body and thinking about body, some of this body image, some of this is just what to do with our bodies. This talk can bring a lot of shame uh, to many of us. And I want to just say right up front, Jesus equalizes all of us when he talks about human sexuality. We all land at the same place. We're all broken. We're all sexual sinners, every single one of us. If you pass pu puberty, you're a sexual sinner, okay? Maybe before that, but you're certainly every one of us. And so shame comes with this, this message, and I've been praying the grace of God would prevail in your life. He loves you. Um, but I want to say this too. Some of y'all, you look in the mirror, frankly, and even this morning you're, you're like, I don't know what to do with this body. Some of us here, all right? 
I don't know what to do with my hair. I don't know what, you know, what to do with, with my body. And so there's a lot of questions around this. But in, in the, this passage, some of you know that Corinth, where this, this uh, message comes from, the book of 1 Corinthians, um, a letter to the Corinthian church. And, and Corinth was a lot like, I imagine a lot like, um, where America is heading today. I, I kind of sense Corinth is a lot like I don't know if it's San Francisco or Vegas, some of our more, much more progressive cities, parts of Dallas, I could say the prevailing worldview, the story that's being played out and told in, uh, in our cities. And America, of course, all the stats show us that we're becoming more and more post-Christian, uh, much like Europe and the modern West. Uh, Corinth was pre-Christian. So they needed to to be recalibrated or or even just, gosh, a new vision for human sexuality. Jesus' vision for and what the scripture teach us. Because the Judeo the Judeo vision of human sexuality was radically different. In fact, uh, different from every other culture, every other teaching. And, And then Jesus comes along, he ramps it up so the sexual ethic of Jesus is a radical, countercultural vision in every culture, in every age. And I want you to see that it is today. It certainly was in Corinth. And and so they needed to to see what is the biblical view. And and we're going to see here, Paul's going to set this in context for us. Uh, And I'm going to do the same before we really jump in a little bit, because I see it very much like what the mindset is, the, the view here in our culture today, in America. So I'm going to do what I've done each week. We're going to look at the world story contrasted up against God's better story. So first, the world story. In this passage, Paul uh, starts with these quotes. They're maxims, you're going to see, going around in the church, and they were just the prevailing worldview that they had. And the first thing I want you to see is this. If you take notes, just a few, few points here, and then we're going to look at God's better story that he outlines for us as well. And then use his teaching as a springboard um, into some other uh, passages of Scripture. The body is about rights, entitlement, and freedom. That's the first thing I want you to see here in verses 12 through 13. Now, a little bit more context here to help you. He's quoting from their culture, and here's what's going on here. Their world was very different from ours. Um, there, in their culture, men would go visit uh, prostitutes. Maybe you've heard this. It was even kind of a, almost a religious thing, but it was not only legal, it was accepted as normal because of a prevailing view, uh, which was based on, by the way, if you've ever studied this in philosophy, Plato's um, view of the body and the soul. Uh, And so they had this platonic view that was this. There was this soul-body dichotomy, which means, uh, hey, the soul matters, the body doesn't matter. So whatever I do with my body is not really affecting me. There is this you know, division, a distinction between body and, and soul. So here's what I want you to see here. Look at what he says in verse 12. All things are lawful for me. Even Paul kind of taught this. Hey, we have freedom now, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. So now here's what's happening. They, these people in the church are actually mounting a defense as new believers, okay, to say, hey, we're just, we're just going to argue that, you know, we can do what culture is doing. It's not a big deal. We're, we, can go, we can have sex. With, in fact, the sexual latitude allowed for men to have sex with, watch this, yes, women, women they're not married to. And again, this was normalized. Uh, they even have sex with girls, even boys, And there was no real restrictions for men. Now, here's what you get to when you have this soul-body dichotomy. The body, look at what he says here. It's it's meant for just, just kind of please my appetites, if you will. They just wanted to continue a practice that was widely accepted. Now, as you're getting, you know, freaking out a little bit, I thought about every now and then I could put up a picture of, um, there's a baby, you know, or there's a kitten, you know, or something. It just kind of help us here. But before we, we freak out too much here, um, there, there's, do you see any connection in our culture today? I can do with my body what I want to do. 
You making any, any parallels here? That, that I can have a kind of out of soul experience, if you will, and have sex with whomever I want to have sex with because it's just my body. In fact, it's my body. I can have sex with whoever I want to. Male, female, friend, co-worker, open marriage, whatever goes. In fact, the whole Me Too movement is around non-consensual sex, which is brought about generally by the domination of men who have come to believe, I can do what I want to do. Sex is an appetite that needs to be filled. So I'm going to have sex with whomever. It's my body. I can do whatever I want with my body. Um, I can fill it with whatever. I can, I, can, I, I can have surgery if I don't like my body. I can change my body. This is real, and this is the pro-choice stance as well, isn't it? You're entitled. It's my body. I can do whatever I want with my body. This is the problem with our hookup culture. It's the problem with porn. I can gratify the sexual desires I have. I'm not hurting anyone, we think, because of the soul-body distinction. We are, this is our culture. We've not moved from Corinth, not too far away. I'm not hurting anybody. I can, you know, and, and, and he says, look, I'll use his word. I won't let anything dominate me. And yet many of you know, many of us in, in the room are dominated by an addiction to pornography. Dominated, which means to have authority over, to guide and to rule over one. And so many of us, and, and men, I just want to challenge you. You've got to enter into accountable relationships. Courageous men are men who say, I've I got a problem, and I need help. To come alongside your wife or friend, a good friend, or other men in particular. That's why we're having our small groups among many reasons. Men need to be accountable with men. And the most courageous men among us are doing so. Look at number two. The body is about appetites. I've already noted that. Another maxim. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. So uh, I've got a stomach, needs food. Uh, I've got sexual desires and, and I've got sexual parts. And I just need to satisfy that too. If I have a body, then I need to satisfy, gratify these sexual desires. In fact, well, God's given me this, these desires. I need to gratify them, right? We still have this kind of, uh, of thought in our culture today. Uh, sex is a transaction. It's an animalistic desire that you just need to, to fill. Number three, the body doesn't matter. And God will destroy both one and then the other. They believe that there was no greater story going on here. Uh, we have bodies. There's souls. They would, say, they would argue the soul matters, the spirit matters, but the body doesn't matter. And this platonic, dualistic view of the body and soul has led us, even still, to all kinds of problems and shame and a lot of pain. Every one of us. So, the world story, let me summarize, even in greater ways. Humans are animals that have had evolutionary time and chance on their side. we just kind of risen up. There's no meaning behind our bodies. There's, there's no meaning or purpose seen in our bodies. We're created male and female. Why? The, the propagation of the species. That's why. No, no, no. Yes and no. What if, what if I never have sex? What if I never get married? What if I, whenever I never get pregnant? What if I never make someone pregnant? It, it, listen, there's a greater story going on here. There's a reason. Think about it. God could have created us in any way to propagate the species. Look at the animal kingdom. There's some funky ways that animals are like reproduced. And I thought about some video there, but that, that would be, and that, you know, that'd be kind of cool and wild. But I mean, we could, he could have created us anyway. We could have, we could have spit on each other or something and you're pregnant, you know, or whatever. Um, and, and so, which, which gets me to, you know, when I was a youth minister, I'd meet with, this happened, I mean, with, with, with girls who were, you know, just, I mean, I'm, I'm pregnant, you know, and it was an accident. And always, I never quite said this because you can't as a pastor, but I'm like, what kind of accident was that? <laughs> what are you walking down the hall? You're both, you're both butt naked and you bumped into each other. I mean, what, <laughs> what in the world kind of accident makes that happen? Not an accident is kind of my point. Because God's designed us a way, right? But here's what happens. Male and female, again, back to the secular view, the, the world's view, it's just plumbing. 
It's just, you know, how we, and, and gender now, we don't talk about sex, now we talk about gender, which is more fluid, and gender is a social construct. Sex is how we've been created. Male and female is just plumbing, right? Monogamy, uh, that's just not a natural thing. Uh, marriage is just, you know, for happiness. We've talked about this recently. The reason I get married is to get happy, make me happy. And many of us who are, are single think that, man, if I just could get married, I'd finally ultimately be happy, maybe. Uh, and some of us who are married, we're going, yeah, I wish I was not married because I'm not very happy. Um, and we, because we think that marriage is about making us happy. And we've said that happiness we've defined as pleasure. Anything that brings pleasure to me makes me happy. So, in fact, anything outside of you, any, uh, we talked about this last week, um, any outside authority that's going to tell you how to live is oppressive. Anything inside of you that you can't fulfill, desires you have, is repressive. And so we've got to push all this away. There's no creator. So, gang, listen, just be kind, make lots of money, have fun, eat your kale salad, drink your cold brew, have sex, be happy. That is the secular story. And again, been asking each week, how's that going for us? And it is a story not working for us. So what I want to do is talk about God's better story for our bodies. All right? Now, this story is very different. Sex has meaning, and we were created male and female together. Watch this. I want you to hear this clearly. Together and individually, our bodies tell a story. Now, keep Keep tracking with me here. Why did God create us male and female? Okay, again, to propagate the species. Okay, what about the 99.9999% of the time that you're not having sex? What's going on? Why are our bodies created the way they are? Because a lot of, a lot of single people think you get married and you have sex all the time. Um, it's not really the case. Um, and so a lot of us, like, I don't see anybody having sex right now. I mean, that's good. But, um, but most, sorry, most of your day, to mo like most of your life, you're not having sex. There's something else going on here. There's something else. There's a story to be told, okay? So our bodies are made, look at this. Here's the redemptive story. Our bodies are made by God and for God. The body, here's what he says. The body's not meant for sexual immorality. That word is pornea, by the way. But for the Lord, which is all kinds of sexual immorality. This is where we get our word porn, okay, pornea. And the Lord for the body. The body is made for him. And it's not saying, well, he was made for our body. No, but watch this. It's gonna, it's, it happens, right, that, that the Lord is for our body. And we're going to see he's, gonna, he's in our body. We, we, uh, uh, Megan led us toward that earlier. He, he, he's in us. We live this resurrected life now. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. So watch this. He's noting that the body's eternal. The body matters where they thought, yep, body's done, life is over. Many people believe that today, right? So our story begins like this. Follow along with me. You know this. Genesis 1.26. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now look, you notice that. You've heard this teaching before. Perhaps us. What is this us? God is in perfect relationship with himself. This triune God is in a whole, loving, holistic, eternal relationship with himself. He is relational. He doesn't need us. But he's the creator. Then it says here, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Watch this. Male and female, he created them. And thus reveals who he is. Listen, males and females equally and together proclaim and, and display the image of God and who he is. So you are a body and a soul that are connected. That's the biblical view. Now, you might have heard, like me, I read years ago, I've read it many times, C.S. Lewis said something like, uh, do you remember this? You don't have a soul, you are a soul, you have a body. Now, if you look at the Google, the interwebs, um, you realize he, did, he never said that. You, you can't find that. That quote is a bit off. In, in fact, even if he did say that, He's only half right, because when your body and soul are not connected, 
uh, you're dead. Is what that is. Um, and there's coming a day, though, when our bodies, Megan noted it earlier, our bodies are going to come together. A resurrected bodies, we call it the resurrection of the dead. When our bodies and our souls are going to come together in the new creation, in the new earth, this is why the physical resurrection of Jesus matters. It's why a Gnostic heresy steps in in the early church and they say, no, he wasn't a ghost. He was for real physical because this is where all of history is heading. Worshiping a resurrected Savior with a real body. Uh, in fact, you want to know what, God's, what our resurrected bodies will be like ultimately? Look at Jesus, those moments that he appears after his resurrection. We will be like him. We're going to become like him. Perfect bodies. All of the sin of our bodies, sexual sin and shame, will be done away with. And this is at the core of our doctrine. The resurrected Jesus. So look, number two in God's better story. Our bodies are made to tell the story of God. Human sexuality tells a story. Now look at this. Here's what he says. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who, jo who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who jo is joined to the Lord, and here's where, where his real point is, he who's joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. So the story of our bodies becomes that, that we are one with Christ. We're to be united with him. And this is, see, for my, my single friends, Jesus, uh, Mary, all of us, Jesus was the most alive, joyful, fulfilled, purposeful person on the planet and he never got married, and he never had sex. And, and, and many have kind of followed the way of Jesus, you know, in that way. But this is also why Paul says, I wish everybody was single like me. Why? Because, in essence, Paul is saying, because I'm married to Jesus. That's why. I'm not distracted. Now, before my single friends, you're rolling your eyes, going, yeah, I'm married to Jesus, whatever. I mean, yeah, that, I'm, yeah I get that. I want to get married, okay? I want to have sex is what I want to do. And, and listen, this is true for all of us. I want to encourage you because I single friends, and this is, this is true, this is all of us. You have an opportunity to say, let me show you what it's like to be married to Jesus in a culture that has made marriage an idol. And we get to say to our friends, hey, you know what? I, am, I have this this gospel peace and rest in my soul, in my heart. I have a non-anxious presence in my life because of Christ. He is enough for me. And if, you, if we don't get that in our marriage, then we're, our marriage are jacked up. Because we're trying to seek from the other what they were never intended to give us. Okay, but again, why male and female? A man's body doesn't make sense by itself. A woman's body doesn't make sense by itself. Right? A man's body and a woman's body, you could argue, is, is exactly the same. Head, arms, hands, feet, and such. Except for two parts, primarily. Exactly the same except for two parts. There's a reason that our bodies are exactly the way they are. And again, we just think, well, that propagate the species. Okay, yes and no. Now, let me pause for a minute and say this. Surely all of us are broken in so many ways. Uh, if, you, if you think through this like I do, think, think, but think about the biblical vision of sex. We see in creation that, that this is the way it goes. But the fall has been carried into our bodies. Clearly has been carried into our desires. Some people are born even physically. Some are born intersexed. Some, some just, we, we struggle with lust. We struggle with desires. We, we struggle with, you know, homosexual, bisexual desires or gender fluidity. We have all kinds of challenges. But I want to, I want to say this. Jesus does not accept the normalization of our broken condition. He doesn't. He accepts us. He receives us by his grace. But Jesus takes, again, the Judeo, 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 Judeo sexual ethic to another level. You remember when he says in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, hey, uh, many of you have heard adultery is wrong. Okay, that's a sin. But I'm telling you, if you seek after someone else to satiate your sexual desires in your mind, that's adultery. 
and no one had ever heard this before. If you have lustful thoughts towards another person, if you think, man, I'd like to have her, I'd love to have him, you commit adultery. Jesus equalizes all of us, and what he's saying here is we're all broken, and we're all sexual sinners. So there is no place for pride in this conversation. Not from your pastor, not from anybody here. So God creates us in his own image. And then it says, for this reason, Genesis 2, 24, a man shall leave his father and mother and the two shall become one flesh. For this reason, what reason? Because they're created male and female. Okay? Then we, okay, Jeff, tracking with you. Then we get married. But listen, this is to tell a story. But even if we never, ever get married, because we all heard, have heard, if you've been here much, we've heard the story of marriage. Marriage is this mystery, and Paul says, and it's about Christ and his church. Marriage is a model, an, uh, we call it an icon. It's an image of Christ and his church becoming one. So marriage clearly is pointing to another story. Here's the crazy thing about marriage. With all that's being said about marriage today, Christian marriage is not about the marriage. It's about something else. It's about Christ and his pursuit of us. So we all, males included, we become the, the female, if you will. We become the bride. He's the groom, right? But all of this starts throughout all of church history and throughout all of redemptive history. Look at how this goes. Creation starts with a marriage. I've taught on this before a bit, but here in the year of the Bible, this is the story. Marriage began, okay, Adam and Eve are married in, 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 in uh, they're, they're created for each other in the garden. They have this perfect relationship and union with God, okay? Then the fall, things will go south quick in chapter three of Genesis. There's a promise of a seed that's to come. Then God pursues his people. We're married to him. He's pursuing us to marry us. There's all kinds of marriage covenantal language in the giving of the law. A covenant agreement. I do. I agree. We're following you. And then what do we do? We. We, the people of Israel and all people, have decided we're not going to follow you. We're going to be unfaithful. What is idolatry and unfaithfulness called in the Old Testament often? Adultery. In fact, you can go further. Uh, in fact, well, let's do this. Let's look at these, these passages here. Here's Isaiah 62, verse 5. For as a young man uh, marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. It goes on. Jeremiah 30, verse 20. Surely as a, tre a treacherous wife, okay, adulterous wife leaves her husband, so have you been treacherous to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. Now look at this, Ezekiel 16. When I passed by you again and saw, behold, you were at an age for love. And I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. And I made a vow, my vow to you, and entered into covenant with you, declares the Lord, and you became mine. There's even erotic language here. We see this in the book of Solomon. And watch this, Ezekiel 16, 30. How sick is your heart, declares the Lord God, because you did all these things, the deeds of a brazen prostitute. Wow. You even have Hosea, remember the prophet, marry a prostitute. God says, stay married, committed to her, even though she keeps on doing you wrong, because that's a picture of my love. Here's the point. The entire arc of biblical history is a marriage, our, un, uh, our unfaithfulness, our adultery, all right, Christ coming as the groom, we're the bride, and then ultimately the culmination of all this is another wedding, the ultimate wedding, the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation. So does sex matter? All right, keep, keep, keep hanging with me here. This is interesting. God is always male, and humanity is always female. Uh, God is always the husband. We're always the wife, men included. Christ is the groom, uh, we are the bride, right? Why is that? Watch this. God is the initiator. He's always coming to us. He's the pursuer. We are the receiver. The man's body presents, uh, gives the seed to the woman. God comes, there's a seed that's promised. The seed comes, and how about this? Literally goes into the womb of Mary. Mary is impregnated by God himself. Now, hang with me. 
God is not sexual. God is not a male. In fact, there's all kinds of female references to God throughout the Bible. Even Jesus says, I'm like a mother hen gathering her chicks. Wisdom, which is a big part of the Bible, actually takes on a female uh, personification and role. So God is not sexual. He's spirit. He's not like us, right? But this entire story points to, and our bodies then, number three, finally, our bodies tell the story of the gospel. Becoming one with him, we are one with him, we enter into Trinitarian union with him, married, single, whatever else. And again, this is why Paul says, I I just wish everybody wasn't distracted with all this stuff of, of marriage and all of that, that they could focus completely on him. And that's our goal and our role as married people as well. So look at how he closes. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee from sexual immorality then. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? You see this story? We are the ones who receive now the location of God's Spirit, formerly in Jesus Christ himself. Prior to that, the temple now is, resides in us. Our bodies. I'm to glorify him with my body. Look at this. He goes on. You are not your own. Your body doesn't belong to you. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God with your body. What do we do with these hands? What do I do with my feet? What do I do with this body? I glorify God with it. In my maleness. In my femaleness, I give all that I am to him, and my body tells a story. I run from sexual immorality. I run to God, and I find in him that he is enough. Jesus says this. Listen. Jesus says, give me your desires, whatever they are, twisted and jacked up. Give me your desires, and I will change your desires. Now, there's so much more that I could say here, but I'm going to close our time allowing us, each one of us, to to just pause and think about our lives. So I want you to do this. Kind of free up your hands. What do we do with these hands? Okay. Um, And I'm going to close with this. We've done this in recent days. I want you to just, just lay your hands out before you like this, palms up. And I want you to bow your head. And close your eyes. We're going to close with a moment of prayer. And this could be the most important moment of your week. Probably is. For some of us, I've been praying that this message would change the trajectory of your life. But some of us are going to need to talk to someone. Whether it's sexual sin. Shame that's been undealt with. Sexual past. We all have a sexual past. Friend, you're not defined by your sexual past. You're defined by Jesus' past. And his past is perfect. If you're in him. If you've received his grace. So with these hands, let it represent your entire body. This is spiritual formation. Being conformed into his image. And I want to ask this question. Who am I becoming by what I am doing with my body? And I want you to have a moment. Just, what do you need to say to him? With your palms up to receive what he has for you today. How will you act upon this message? Lord, we we thank you for the beautiful story of our bodies. That our bodies tell your story, the gospel story. We thank you for the fact that you have, those of us who've received your grace, have received your spirit. We have an imputed righteousness that has changed our lives. We have your spirit within us that gives us resurrected power to overcome sin in our lives. But we need each other. I pray for courage. For those of us who, all of us, who need to Share and talk about this message and talk about how we can apply it to our lives. So, Lord, we know what to do with these hands. We know what to do with our feet as we go. We go to live in our bodies 
filled by your spirit to glorify you. We do it all because you've come to rescue us from our sin. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your grace. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.